Well, let's turn together in God's Word this morning to Revelation 19, and we'll be looking at verses 11 through 16 together. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, where God's Word reads as follows. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses." From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So far the reading from God's word this morning, may he add its blessing to our hearts. There is a rightful criticism that is at times offered when it comes to reading through the Bible from cover to cover in a specific span of time, whether it be a, a one-year plan or more or, or less. And the, the criticism is this, that when you read the Bible from cover to cover with time constraints placed on you, your reading becomes an assignment and you fail to read for understanding. And although there is some validity to that criticism, the practice of reading through the whole Bible is still a very useful and good exercise. So if the time constraints is what makes it a reading assignment to you, please remove the time constraints and still commit yourself to reading through the scriptures from cover to cover. Because in doing so, what you get from the Bible is the big picture you get the whole counsel of God. And that is important if we are to know God properly and fully and thoroughly. It's important when it comes to our Lord Jesus Christ as well, as can be seen from this text. A text like this helps us under, understand Christ in a way that sometimes we neglect thinking about Him. It helps us to see Christ from the perspective that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. <clears throat> and so as we seek to learn that lesson this morning, we we'll want to divide this text into two parts. First, we want to see a description of this king in verses 11 through 13. <clears throat> and then we also want to see the king in action in verses 14 through 16. So Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We want to see the king described and the king in action. So let's begin by looking at, this, at a description of this king. In verse 11, as John continues in his vision, he sees heaven opened. Now, it's not the first time in the book of Revelation that John has seen heaven opened. He also sees heaven opened in Revelation 4 and verse 1, where the door of heaven is opened and he sees this glorious vision of the throne room of heaven. <clears throat> there are other uh, places in Scripture where something similar is described in the book of Revelation, Revelation eleven nineteen, Revelation 15, verse 5. There you have the temple in heaven opened as well. And it's a similar description. And each time a description of this nature is given to us in this book, Something heavenly is being revealed. Something that's <clears throat> not evident to us on a day-to-day -day basis. In some sense, the curtain of the heavenly place is pulled back. And something of the heavenly glory, a manifestation of God's power, is revealed to those who read the testimony of God as given in this prophecy, this revelation that we are studying together. And so here... In Revelation 19, when, when the, the curtain of heaven is pulled back and heaven is opened, we see something of the glory of Christ. <clears throat> and we know it's the 
the Christ who is in view from verse 13, where it says that his name is called the Word of God. In different places, the Lord Jesus Christ is called the Word of God. One such example would be in John 1 in verse 14, where John uses the name the Word to describe Jesus. There, you'll, you'll remember how John says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. That is, the, what the Lord Jesus Christ did. And so this rider on the white horse is none other than the Son of God, none other than the second person of the Trinity who was born as a man, known while He walked on this earth as Jesus of Nazareth, who is the mediator of God's people. And the picture that is shown here of him in Revelation is not the one that is used most often, even in, in Scripture, but also in our own consideration of, of who God is. If you think about Christ as he's manifest to us in the Gospels, uh, you usually have a picture, although not exclusively in the Gospel, but usually you have a picture of of Jesus' mercy, his, his patience towards mankind, his, <clears throat> his acceptance of the sinner. And those things are highlighted when we read through the Gospels, and they're often highlighted uh, in our own minds even as we think of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a good cause for that, because the Lord Jesus Christ is merciful, and the Lord Jesus Christ is patient, and the Lord Jesus Christ is a friend of sinners. We should praise God for that. Otherwise, none of us would be here today. It's how any Christian comes to be forgiven through the mercy and patience and, and kindness of God extended to him through faith in Christ Jesus. It is in the fact that Christ takes on himself this divine wrath. It's in the fact that Christ hangs on the cross and cries out that God has forsaken him, it is in that mercy and that steadfast love of God that our hope uh, is, is found. And yet, in this text, Christ is described differently. In this text, Christ is described as riding out as a general at the head of his army. Christ is seated on a white horse. He's not entering Jerusalem meekly on a donkey. He is striking down the nations instead of calling the nations to himself. He's not suffering under the hand of his enemies, but he is judging and making war in righteousness against his enemies. And that's a different side of Christ that we also must know and we must not neglect it we must know christ fully we we must not have a caricature of christ we do the same thing in our human relationships isn't this right we don't when we know a person we don't only know a small part of them we don't know just one side of them that's why when we live in families we can be so accepting of each other because we see each other for for all of the things that we are, good, bad, and ugly, and, and knowing those things about each other, yet we, we accept each other. And the same thing is true in the case of knowing Christ. We, we can't only know just one aspect of him. We must know him fully. Uh, Jesus is the high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. But that's not all that he is. Today's preference is to think of Christ in his weakness and in his places of what we would call his humiliation. But there are also the texts that we have before us uh, today. Today's preference is to think of Christ as born the helpless child. To think of Christ as the one who is silent before his accusers. The Jesus who is unwilling to condemn the woman who is caught in adultery. To think of Jesus as the one who is rejected by the very world that he created. To think of Jesus as the one who cries out on the cross when his 
Father forsakes him. To think of Jesus as the one who has his lifeless side pierced by the spear of the Roman soldier. To think of Jesus as the one whose lifeless body was taken by Joseph of Arimathea and placed in his own tomb under death where he remained for three days. All of those things are beautiful and they are good and they are part of what we would call Christ's humiliation. They are necessary and we must know Christ in that way and we must praise praise Christ for, for humbling himself in that way and yet it is only part of who he is. Now the suggestion I'm making is not that we would leave aside these aspects of Christ's humiliation. They are, they are right, and, and we must not forget them. But we must also remember how he is exalted. We must also remember now how he is described in this text as coming out, riding before his heavenly army. Christ today, he is no longer in his humiliation. Christ today is already exalted. He lives in exaltation ever since he has been raised from the dead. He is so now, and there is yet one part left to be done, which is his judgment of the world. To have a Christ who is only weak, to have a Christ who only lives in his humiliation is not the full picture. Yes, for 33 years, our Savior lived in weakness. For 33 years, He suffered in this world. He was weak, but now He is the conquering rider who is described as wearing a robe that is dipped in blood. It's a full description of who Christ is. In our text, it says, that he is faithful and true. It says that he judges in righteousness and makes war in righteousness. He is described as the one who has eyes that are like flames of fire. He is adorned in royal splendor, and his name is so great that no one can even know it but Christ himself. That is Christ, too. Not just the Christ who lives in weakness. Not just the Christ who is in his humiliation. But the Christ who reigns in glory. It is to be included in what we know of Christ. And the description in our text helps us to have an understanding of Christ beyond just the Jesus who is weak and who is suffering and who lived on this earth. To think of Christ only in his humiliation is in some sense to neglect the reason of his coming. And that's what we see when we look at the king in action. Jesus, when he walks on this earth, he comes humbly. And that's not a mistake. Jesus comes humble. But Christ's humility is not the goal. Christ's humiliation is part of what Christ does as becoming the Passover lamb, the one whose blood is spread on the doorpost of our hearts so that the angel of judgment would pass over us. And yet, before his incarnation and after his incarnation, Christ is only glory. He is only glory. It's one of the great mysteries as to why People insist on focusing on Christ in his weakness at the exclusion of Christ in his exaltation. I want us to look together in Philippians 2. I want you to turn there with me today. Philippians 2, and starting in verse 5, where there's this description of the Lamb of God and his ministry and what Christ does in coming to earth. I'm going to read from verses 5 through 11 so that we can see uh, both Christ before his incarnation, during his incarnation, and after his incarnation. 
Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That, my friends, is the full picture. Notice in verse 6, before the incarnation, the Son of God is in the form of God. He is in the heavenly places, in the form of God, which has with it only glory. There's no humiliation prior to the incarnation for Christ. He lives in heaven, in the form of God, in the fullness of glory. And then you come to verse uh, verse 6 and, and 7, where he takes on the form of a servant. And being found in this human form, in verse 8, he humbles himself, becoming obedient even to the point of death, the death on the cross. That's his humiliation. That's where we spend a lot of time thinking about Christ. But then there's, there's verse 9, where because of those things, God exalts him. Exalts him in a way that is not used to describe anybody else. He is given a name that is above every name. His name is exalted. Everybody on earth, whether they love him or they hate him, their knee will bow before him. And that's what's being described in this text. This victorious, conquering Jesus, who is the, the weak mediator who becomes glorified, who is who is exalted beyond anything that we can imagine by God himself. His name is glorious. He leads an army dressed as he is in pure white. Uh, their garments of his soldiers, they were stained with sin, but they have been washed by his blood. And they follow him on their white horses and he strikes down his enemies with a sword which comes from his mouth. This is not the Jesus who is silent before Pilate. This is not the Jesus who stands by idly and lets blasphemers strike him on the mouth. This is the Christ from whose mouth comes a sharp sword. Of course, that reaches back to other places in the book of Revelation where we've seen him described in this way. Revelation 2 and verse 12, it describes Jesus in his letters to the seven churches as having a sharp sword, a two-edged sword. And in verse 16, it says that he's going to make war on these Nicolaitans. You remember the Nicolaitans when we talked about these heretics that had infiltrated the church? Well, Christ is going to make war against them with the sword of his mouth. In verse 15 of our text, we see, in fact, that Christ comes and as he makes war, it says that he will strike the nations with a rod of iron. He will rule them with a rod of iron. That, of course, goes back uh, to Revelation 2 and verse 27, where those who conquer in Christ are given the position of ruling over the nations with Christ, with this rod of iron, and beyond that even, it speaks of Christ in the second psalm, verse 9, where the Father gives to the Son the nations and says that He will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And in this text, when it comes to the nations, break them, He does. The picture is one of complete domination. Look in our text. It says that he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Now, you don't want to take this too far, uh, but imagine the difference between Christ conquering and the nations. 
<clears throat> being between the grape and the horse's hoof. There's not much of a matchup, is it? There's not much of a question who's going to win uh, that fight. Well, the Son of God treads the grapes as part of His judgment on the nations, and He treads the, the, this uh, winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. He tramples His enemies. The second person of the Trinity who comes in weakness, because He becomes the agent of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And that's good news for the persecuted church. That's good news for the church militant, meaning the church that's still on this earth. The church is still fighting the good fight, waiting for Christ to return to be called home uh, in glory. And just in case there's any doubt at all, the baby who is meek and mild, who is first laid in a manger in his humiliation, he is now exalted as he rides out and on his robe and on his thigh are written his name so that we would make no mistake. And what is his name? His name is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oh, beloved, that the kings of this world would remember this that they would know that Jesus is the King of kings, that He is the Lord of lords, that the kings of the earth would serve this Christ who rides out on His white horse, but they don't. And what you have is an unavoidable enmity as powers clash. You see, the Bible describes a mediator who is weak, but he's only weak temporarily. That's where the reading of the whole Scripture comes. Jesus Christ, today, he is not some timid, hapless Savior. He is born in weakness, yes, but to be exalted by the Father so that His name would be above every name, that He would be known and proclaimed and seen by His people as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That means that you and I, as we understand the full picture of Christ, not only His humiliation, but also His exaltation, that we should live as if we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are weak, and God knows our weakness. We're grateful for that. And in our weakness, sometimes we get discouraged, don't we, as Christians? It's not often that in history the Christians seem to be winning. You can point to certain places in history, and, and even when you point to those different places in history, it seems like the time that the Christian church is doing well is, is so short. The moment is so brief and you have times of success and then great failure. Or you have times where there's great revival and then there's great falling away. There's times of, of great joy in the fact that God's name is exalted and that people are following after Him. And then you have seasons of great defeat by the church and even persecution and, and hardship. You have uh, the Christian life as a mixture and if you're not careful, you can start thinking of the Christian life as only suffering, only agony, only pain, only defeat. And in part, that's true. Part of the Christian life is taking up your cross and following after Christ. But that, cro that cross is taken up in the hope that your mediator is the King of kings and the Lord of lords that your mediator has conquered sin and death, that no enemy will be able to stand before him. For the believer, there should be this conviction that you serve the king of kings, and that means that Christ has purchased you. And as Paul says, nothing can separate you from this king of kings and lord of lords. There's no one powerful enough to make war against this rider on the white horse who is who is this name that only can be known by him. 
Christ is not impotent to keep his people, to hold them, to, 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 to exalt them in due season. When you're insulted, when you're mocked, when you're, when you're even attacked for following after Christ, do not forget, my friends, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is no hint of defeat in him. The plan of redemption is accomplished by him, and you are kept in him. You are adopted into the very family of God because of him, and he gives to you these things by grace as a gift through faith. And so, despite our weaknesses, and despite our moments of falling and failing and sinning, as God's people, we have no need to be fearful, ever. So live like you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then the second thing that this text teaches us is that we should not make for ourselves a false god. The temptation of man is always to make idols. Idols can be made when you worship a false god, like in false religions, like uh, Islam and Buddhism and Mormonism and, and so on. But you can also make a false god which is dressed in kind of biblical language. It has biblical names and it has biblical decorations. And that's what we do when we minimize, ignore, and prune off certain aspects of God. That's what's happening when God is only merciful and not just. It's what's happening when God is only just and not merciful. It's what's happening when you say that God will excuse your sin because it's just so hard to obey. Or it's also what's happening when you say that you must try so hard until God approves of you. We must know the God of Scripture. And we must worship the God of Scripture. Well, who is this God? He is as he describes himself. He is the creator of heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. He is the one who looks at his fallen creation, who has rebelled against him willfully and knowingly, not by mistake. And he is the one who from that world pardons sin. He is the lamb who makes himself the sacrifice, the one who takes on human flesh in the person of the son, becoming truly man so that he might stand in the place of sinful men. He is the enlightener of darkened hearts by the work of his spirit that man would know him and love him and be renewed and he is also the just judge who will condemn the obstinate sinner and in all of these things my friends he is the king of kings and the lord of lords he is the one who does all things well he is faithful he is true there is no possibility that he will leave you or forsake you. And that is the God of Scripture. The Redeemer of God's people. The Lamb of God who comes in weakness but is now highly exalted beyond anything that any creature would ever have. In our text, it presents to us an aspect of Christ that we must hold as true. Christ as the conquering rider on the white horse. Christ whose name is faithful and true. Christ who judges and makes war. The one whose eyes are like a flame of fire. The one who is robed in majestic glory. The one whose robe is dipped in blood. And he is your Savior. He is your mediator. And in all the difficulties that this life will throw at you, you can be sure that when you follow this Christ, 
You are following the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's pray together.